ได้ยินเสียงจุมมานาได้ยินไหมคะเอ่อหมออุ๋ยไม่มีเสียงหมออุ๋ยต้องไปที่แชร์สกีนแล้วบอกว่าแล้วก็เลือกแชร์แชร์ voice ด้วยโอเคค่ะแบบนะคะโอเค so sorry ปิดอันนั้นไปแบบนะคะคุณจะเห็นในแชทสกรีนที่แชร์ด้วยวายอ่ะครับอ่าโอเคสวัสดีโอเคไปดูโชว์ฮอร์สกีนโอเคแชร์ซะยาโอเคโอเคคุณเห็นสีดีสกรีนไหม sorry start again welcome to Mali Memon and Sea Turtle Incubator distinguished speakers participants ladies and gentlemen thank you very much for joining this incubator hosted by the Department of Marine and Coastal Resources Thailand with the support from the IOC Waste Pack I would like to express my special thanks to our invited speakers for your participation despite your tight schedules we really appreciate that Marine mammal and sea turtle are the flagship marine species and the bioindicators or sentinel species that indicate the health of ocean ecosystem related to the human health. In recent years, there has been a growing concern about the decline in some marine mammal species and an increasing reported number for stranded animals. Crunchy in the region have been paying more and more attention to the conservation of marine mammals and sea turtles. This incubator will bring together researchers and other relevant stakeholders who are interested in the conservation of marine mammals and sea turtles, initiate a network for marine mammals and sea turtle population assessment toward the development of the UN Ocean Decade Action for the conservation of marine mammals and sea turtles in the region. I do hope you all have a comprehensive discussion and at the end of this two-hour incubator, you could come up with the expected recommendations for research framework and direction in marine mammal and sea turtle that could help contribute to sustainable conservation of marine mammal and sea turtle and fulfill the knowledge gaps during the next decade. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, um, sorry. So, I will, uh, thank you, Ms. Sumana, to for the opening remarks. So, we move to the first speaker. I would like to invite Dr. Tongke Kitty Wetanawong to talk about the introduction of advanced marine mammal. And, and sea turtle study to Sharon. Uh, sorry, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Gongkia to uh, talk about the introduction of advanced marine mammal and sea turtle studies to challenges in conservation management. He has been working as a marine biologist in Phuket Mar uh, Marine Biological Center since 1992. At present, he is a director of PMBC and has expertise in marine mammals and sea turtles conservation. Please welcome Dr. Gong Gia. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, it's, it is quite a happy time to meet your old friends and new friends here. I would like to share my perspective in this UN Ocean Decade kickoff conference. As you know that this session is focusing on marine mammals and sea turtles. I would like to take this opportunity 
to thank online audience and colleagues for your attention and the future collaboration for conserving these animals. It is common that we think about protection when the loss has already occurred. My office also included at Phuket Marine Biological Center. Our interest in marine mammals started with the first stranded case 25 years ago. We have, from that time, we have expanded our stranding network all over the country. Until now, more than 6,000 marine mammals and sea turtle specimens have been collected and necropsied. By study of these specimens and their remains, we have gained more knowledge, little by little. And it's not only the knowledge, but more important things. We have fallen in love with this career, the job of marine and nature species research. And with this passion, we have looked into a very big question, how to protect these animals. The word protection and utilization are opposite actions. That is why we have the word conservation in order to balance between the take and the keep. However, in the real world, it's not easy at all to balance these two things. The long-term sea turtle nesting statistic in Thailand might be an example. In these figures, we will that the impact of, in this figure, reveal the impact of threats dividing into three episodes. The first episode showed the sudden decline up to 85% within only 13 years due to the egg consumption. The, sec the second phase revealed that we lost additional 10% within 30 years due to the fisheries. And lastly, even in the past 30 years that we have implemented National Protection Acts, we still see not much improvement. In fact, the decline of sea turtle populations has not only been occurred in Thailand, but happening in other neighbor countries as well. The nesting statistic uh, in Malaysia, in this case at Trangganu and Sarawak, revealed the decline trend over the same period of time as in Thailand which is not so surprised because we know that sea turtles are highly migratory species. Sea turtle satellite tracking programs in both Thailand and Malaysia reveal the connectivity among populations within these regions. It can be concluded that, that no single country management plan is effective enough. Then the country should step in together and together, the management shall get success. Talking about conservation, let's begin with how to manage conservation. The, the first knowledge required is to understand about state or status. State can be indicated as population size or index such as uh, population health and so on. The more interesting index is trend that show how the state has changed over time. The change can be decreased due to the threat or increased when we try to restore. The cumulative of both effects, effects can be interpreted as risks, which is one of the cons conservation managing tools. Spe speciation is a process that living organisms have gone through their evolution to find their best fit to, for living. Thus, understand, understanding of taxonomy is very important. The misidentification would give the wrong ontogenic understanding and lead to the mismanagement. The recent discovery of Ampang, the 3,300 years old Balin whales, raise awareness of how complex the Balin whales in Soviet Asia could be. The Balin whale in Thailand was thought to be a single species for decades. 
until recently, the data derived from morphology and DNA reveal that, that there are more than three species. And with the new findings, we, we would expect more species to be discovered. As conservation managers, one should keep updating the information for better and proper management plan. The next question, and probably the most important question for conservation management is how many animals are there? Where can they be found? And how does the abundance change over time? Perhaps the most common technique we use to estimate abundance of animal is detent sampling. However, the technique requires certain amount of survey efforts to gain probability detection function in order to calculate the abundance, not including several assumptions that can be easily neglected. In our department, we have responsibility to report national marine mammal status. Even though the detent sampling is a major technique, we also combine other estimation methods to fit the nature of animals and the, and the limited resource and budget. In case of rice whales in the Gulf of Thailand, we have conducted photo identification Mark and recapture then used to estimate population size. The data along with voluntary sighting program allow us to get on the around population dynamic. Together with satellite tracking program and stranding network, make us possible to estimate the birth, mortality, and immigration rate of these whales. In case of dugong or child animals or even sea turtles, an aerial survey is the best and might be the only choice for population assessment. It has been more than 10 years that we have conducted our, sorry, sorry. 10 years that we have conducted our survey for dugong assessment with small fixed wing aircraft However, it's quite expensive and risky. Moreover, it's required an experienced pilot to conduct good transect lines. Despite of fixed wing aircraft, the ease of operating UAV or drone nowadays allow us to take video and photos. We can count the number, measure the size of animals and map the distribution as never before. With photogrammetry, we can construct the size frequency graph that can be used as population health index. index. By combining data from aircraft and UAV, we have more in-depth and precise information, which is in return a better management plan. With the upcoming, with the upcoming improvement of UAV endurance, this tool is very convincing survey technique. Back to basic, an interview was the first technique that Thai researchers employ for study marine mammals and sea turtles. We have gained not only information from of the animals, but also receiving the perspective of local villagers. Thailand together with neighbor countries, we were part of Dugong MOU team to develop standardized Dugong catch and by catch questionnaires. With this method, we are able to get qualitative and quantitative Dugong information as well as spatial data. The technique allows researchers to get information over the large scale within a short period of time. And moreover, it was relatively low cost. Health monitoring program is part of population census for Bryce well in the Gulf of Thailand. Body index along with other health index 
such as external parasites, wounds, and this in this slide show the skin tattoo disease or STD, which is used as indicator of stress. Sometimes it was difficult to de detect foreign mammals directly. Plastic cues may be used. This figure show the feeding trail of dugongs over cigarette bed. The trail show if dugongs are present or absent. The graph in the middle reveal that the length of dugongs can be estimated based on the width of trails. This allows us to understand the population structure. Seagrass recovery study on the right graph show the seagrass, show that the seagrass took about uh, two months for fully recover. Additionally, the carrying capacity of the habitat can be estimated based on the knowledge of seagrass and feeding trail. The passive cue can be obtained with more advanced sensing, such as acoustic locker that can monitor 24 by 7. The next generation DNA sequencing reveals an opportunity to detect these animals by only sampling the sediment and or seawater samples. The knowledge about connectivity among population is another key issue for, conserva for conservation. Understanding how the population relate to each other allow us to, to define conservation managing unit. The in this case, the satellite tech is one of the candidate tools, but the information obtained from DNA analysis tend to be more conclusive. Based on mitochondrial DNA sequencing, as shown in this figure, the green, the green turtle populations around the world uh, around the world can be divided into 11 managing units. However, this figure was only de derived from the limited number of nesting stocks. I would like to encourage all colleagues where possible to collect DNA samples for a better understanding. Sometimes the population may be restricted to a certain area. The recent finding of Dukong genetic diversity from the Western coast of Thailand show the new haplotype that exists nowhere but this area. The, the discover of this unique DNA raised the higher responsibility to conserve this right gene Dukong population. Necropsy is a standard protocol to investigate the cause of death. This job is similar to a detective that requires the look from both inside out about information obtained from the carcass and the outside in to get information from surrounded evidence. The figure show the case of stranded dugong. The Coxy and 3D X-ray results show that the dugong was collided by an artisanal boat Based on drift forecasting model and the condition of the carcass, we were able to track back the location where the, where the incident, incidents occurred. We encourage, where possible, to conduct the coxy for every stranded specimen. At the end of the day, the managing decision has to be made, perhaps, with the best available information. This case, it is the only freshwater Irrawaddy dolphins population in Thailand. The bad news is this population is going to extinct. The recent assessment reported less than 20 animals in the lake. The major threat was unit entitlement, along with other problems such as breeding, inbreeding, populations, pollution, habitat, shallowness, and the, the decline of food source. The dolphins share the common source with many thousands of villages around, uh, around the lake, even though the threat known, but it's not an easy choice to make decisions. 
Lastly, I would like to say that conservation is an adaptive and long-term process. The knowledge that we have obtained might be only a tip of an iceberg. We then shall to we then shall remember the mistake from the past and get moving together with a better conservation approach for a good fate of marine mammals and sea turtles. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. And I think we don't have a time for questions. Maybe I will, uh, uh, we will uh, answer the questions later. So thank you, Dr. Gongke, for your wonderful presentation. After we know about how important and uh, interesting thing of these creatures, so next we move to our next speakers. Uh, is a senior museum researcher who has over a decade of experience in marine mammal research and conservation in the in the Philippines. Please welcome Dr. Jo Marie Acides. Hi, good morning, everybody. Good morning, John. All right. Um, before I start, I should share my video. And let's go. Can everyone see my slides? Yes. yes. All right. Okay. So again, good morning, everyone. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. It is a pleasure to be invited to speak here today. And I thank the Department of Marine and Coastal Resources of Thailand for inviting me to participate. I am a senior museum researcher from the National Museum of the Philippines. I am here today to share some insights on conservation management of marine mammals and sea turtles based on my experience working in the Philippines and in the Southeast Asia region. Although most of what I will share, I have drawn from the Philippines, I believe there are many similarities and parallels with other countries in this region. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's right. um, the Southeast Asian region is an area of high marine biodiversity, and this includes at least 36 species of marine mammals and five species of marine turtles. This is not surprising given the highly productive and rich marine environment with diverse habitats. Our diverse communities also have deep and rich cultures tied to the seas and oceans and the animals that inhabit it. It goes without saying that our nation's peoples have a close and complex relationship with the marine environment, which has evolved, changed over the centuries. As diverse as our nations are, so are the variety of management systems that we employ for the conservation of these animals. In recent decades, we have come to realize that our relationship with the sea, the ocean, and the organisms that live within it is an interdependence, and some may even say we need the ocean and everything in it more than they need us. What we do to the oceans, to marine animals, we do to ourselves. Hence, we need healthy seas, healthy oceans. So how are we doing in taking care of our seas, our oceans, and all these marine animals? Today, I'll be sharing some insights into the current threats to these animals in our region. I will also talk about some of the efforts researchers, scientists, and conservationists are doing to help protect and conserve marine mammals and sea turtles. I will also give some context on how some countries are managing these species based on the legal instruments and mandates of their respective local agencies. In recent years, particularly in the last decade, uh, threats to these marine animals in our marine environment have become more evident more evident that we can no longer ignore it. Pollution, habitat destruction, bycatch or accidental catch, ocean noise, climate change. These are probably the top threats. It is also important to note that many marine mammal and sea turtle populations are yet to recover from the impacts of long histories of um, capture or hunting. These are not just threats in the Southeast Asian region, but around the world. Who manages these animals? Who manages marine mammals and sea turtles? And how are they managed? Each country has its own management system and governing body that has mandate over the protection and conservation management of marine mammals and sea turtles 
in Thailand, for example, um, as demonstrated by Dr. Konkiat earlier, it is the Department of Marine and Coastal Resources. Uh, in Indonesia, marine mammals are under the mandate of the Ministry of Fisheries and Marine Affairs, but the Ministry of Forestry have also initiated programs for marine mammal management and conservation. In the Philippines, dugongs and sea turtles are under the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, or DNR, while cetaceans, uh, whales, dolphins, and porpoises are under the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources, which is under our Department of Agriculture. In addition to that, we also have the Biodiversity Management Bureau, also under our DNR, and the management of protected areas also falls under the mandate of the DNR. Taking the Philippines as an example, one challenge in the management of the species is the overlap of jurisdictions and often unclear mandates or responsibilities. All species of marine mammals and sea turtles are protected in the Philippines. And as mentioned earlier, two government agencies are mandated to ensure their protection and conservation. However, often the overlap of jurisdictions in gray areas and management makes enforcement of the law difficult. On the ground level, people get confused on who to report strandings or sightings or violation of laws such as capture of a dolphin or a sea turtle. And this may sometimes lead to delays in enforcement or the information is lost among the maze of offices. Um, although the upside of this is the two departments often have to work together when dealing with this species. But perhaps what is more of a problem is that neither department has a regular long-term program that focuses on the research and conservation of marine mammals or sea turtles specifically. Um, most of the projects um, being conducted in the Philippines for the past, let's say, 20 or so years have been mainly uh, conducted by NGOs or individuals affiliated with uh, certain universities with funding um, coming from either foreign grants or foreign institutions. There is also a need for a national database for each animal group to serve as a repository of information and specimens, a database that can be used or accessed by government agencies, NGOs, research institutions, or individuals, um, a database that is open for access and can be utilized, evaluated, and even verified, not a database that is only collected by a certain group and only accessible to a certain group. In order to do proper conservation management of marine mammals and sea turtles, we need to overcome this research obstacle. And I think Dr. Konkiat really described it quite perfectly about all the research that has been done, but still needs to be done and all the challenges that goes with it, depending on the technology that you need to use. And of course, that, that goes without saying that funding is definitely uh, part of that challenge. There, there's this paper that came out very recently, a few months ago, that looked into the patterns of research effort and extinction risk of marine mammals in the Philippines. Although the authors investigated the Philippines and focused on marine mammals specifically, I believe that their findings are not far from the situation in other countries in the Southeast Asian region and for other large marine species like sea turtles. One main point that they started out was Global marine mammal research is disproportionately lacking compared to terrestrial mammal research and is strongly biased towards populations in Europe, North America, New Zealand, and Australia. And they go on in saying that research is still lacking. Again, as mentioned by Dr. Konkiat earlier, uh, particularly on topics such as population distribution, abundance, processes, um, and ecology. Um, research is also basically inadequate. And those that explicitly designed to address species conservation are few and far between. Continued monitoring of populations has not been undertaken since laws were passed protecting them. In the case of the Philippines, 
most of these laws were passed in the 80s or the late 90s. So that's a long time ago, yet there was never any monitoring of, again, as mentioned in the earlier presentation, any trends or changes in populations or distribution about um, what was known about a particular population of sea turtle or species of cetacean. It is important to document the consequences of what we believe are conservation actions in order to determine if efforts have been effective. This will also allow us to prioritize our actions, uh, future projects, and the design of more cost-effective use of funding that is very limited to begin with. It can be said, compared to other developed nations, we in this region have been many steps behind when it comes to marine mammal conservation management. Yet, we have achieved so much in, in the past decade, especially. Some of the conservation efforts and achievements, um, of course, uh, I'm only limited mainly on what I know about the Philippines, and some of them are one, uh, efforts have continued to expand network of MPAs and some of them include parts of habitats of marine mammal species and some sea turtles as well. We have identified the important marine mammal areas, uh, marine key biodiversity areas around the country, all of which can be used as basis or justification for place-based conservation. For some species, Research has progressed through the years, increasing our knowledge on the species and their populations, allowing for better decision-making and in mitigating certain threats. Through our Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources, we now have the Philippine Aquatic Red List Committee, and under which were formed subcommittees for various taxonomic groups, including cetaceans. Through this subcommittee, not only are local experts identified, but research and conservation projects funded by the government can be established and implemented. There are many more achievements and conservation success stories in the region, and I believe one factor of success is the support and collaboration among our nations. In 2013, the third Southeast Asian Marine Mammal Symposium was held in Langkawi, Malaysia. And I believe a number of the people here in this um, incubator session were part of that. Um, this symposium brought together researchers from around the Southeast Asian region to discuss various issues on conservation and biology of coastal, inshore, estuarine, and riverine marine um, mammals. Uh, it was also an opportunity to give updates on the status of species found in the region and how each country was doing in the research and management of these animals. As this was already the third symposium with the previous two held in the Philippines in 1995 and 2002, it was interesting to see how each country progressed from the first to the third symposium. And I remember some of the senior scientists who were present in all three of the symposia, symposia commented that although there were significant progress in terms of knowledge on species and research technologies used, there were striking features that barely changed through the years. And this was mainly on the problem uh, we faced and how we were dealing with them. Um, I don't think I can say it any better. So I just quote Dr. Randy Reeves in what he wrote in the symposium report. He says, we need to realize that not all conservation problems can be solved with more money and that governance issues need to be resolved before a fix is feasible. For conservation to be effective, certain political and economic systems need to be changed as does human demography issues that are also beyond the workings of scientists. There is a need for inter, cross, transdisciplinary work when tackling conservation topics in order to manage such issues comprehensively. And he also says conservation needs to be inclusive, reasonable, and practical. Finally, he ends by saying, in the end, 
it is important to avoid incessant negativity. It is much more effective to acknowledge improvements in conservation, celebrate the successes, and continue to encourage young people to carry the torch for this field. And I sincerely believe that. And with that, thank you very much. Salamat po, Kapnika. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. John. Wow, it's, it's good. Okay, we have another converness, uh, Ms. Cha, you just jump in. Your turn. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. John, for your uh, valuable presentation. So we now we, we know what you have been done uh, from your experience and what we weren't going to do next. And what is the challenges and the gaps? So uh, thank you again, and we move forward to the next presentation. Are you hear me? In, in, in the meeting room, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. So, okay. I, I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Nantarika and Dr. Pachara Pon, please. Okay. okay, good morning everyone. My name is Pashara Pon Gamung. I am veterinarian from Phuket Marine Biological Center. And today I'm going to talk about marine animal species and standing management in Thailand. This is the outline of my presentation. First, we are going to cover the situation of marine species in Thailand. Then we will move on the standing network in Thailand, the conservation and management of marine species, and then the conclusion. So we are going to start with the endangered species in Thailand. Department of Marine and Coastal Resource is responsible for the research and protection of both the Andaman Sea and Gulf of Thailand. We have three main missions, which are population survey and estimation, sea turtle research and nursery, and endangered marine species research and rescue. For the MCR, we are responsible for a total of 28 marine mammal species and five sea turtle species. These are the example of standing. We have in the past, there are the variation of species from the small fillet toy and other letter back sea turtle to a live standing or sperm whale calf. With these standing events, a resident center and standing network, it means for the success of marine life conservation. Therefore, due to the past standing and the abundance of marine resources along the coast of Thailand, Silitan Marine and Animal Rescue Center, what fell under Her Royal Highness Vincent Sitriwan Warinari Rakaskanya, conserving coral reef and marine life foundation. In this rescue center, we have rescued over 90 sea turtles per year. The main species we have rescued, rehabilitated, and released back to the sea are green turtle, hospital turtle, and only the sea turtle. For dolphin and whale rescue and habitation, 
We have over 40 cases per year in the past. We have to improve with and uh, remove. We, we have to improvise with movable pool or outdoor environment. But with the rescue center, we now have a facility for dolphin well and dugong rescue and rehabilitation. This is the number of standing case we had in a decade of our vision to protect marine resort and endangered marine species and expanding the standing network. Uh, in 2021, we have more care in sea total with 60%. In dolphin and whale is 37%. In dugong is 3%. And proportion of standing animal between Gulf and Thailand in the slideshow. On 2021, from identified cross data, the cross of standing in Thailand, the sea total are mostly from human cross, mainly marine babies. In dolphin and whale, are mostly natural cares mainly sickness and disease, as same as dugong. In the next topic about the styling network, I will give the call to Professor Dr. Natalie Kasatsu from Veterinary Medical Aquatic Animal Research Center of Excellence, Tula Longkorn University. You will Good morning, welcome. everyone. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, uh, symposium. For over two decades, DMCR have been collaborating, collaborating with uh, Chulalongkorn University to set up strong marine um, endangered species stranding network to help save these species. Our standing responses pro processes include various entities especially the local people, NGO, and other concerning government offices. The system have been set up to handle both live and dead animals in uh, various places. The first responders, mostly the locals, play the vital role in handling the stranding events. Therefore, we have put a very strong emphasis on keeping them informed so, them, so they can handle both live and dead strand stranding accordingly. After the first training course for DMCR staff in 2013, we have been expanded the training to other relevance group and three Asian ASEAN countries. And um, the good news is in the last four years, we had 33 training courses for the local people, participants from 17 coastal provinces of the Gulf of Thailand and six provinces of Andaman Sea, together with um, NGOs and private sectors and government sectors. We can, we can divide the participants into five categories. Um, we are emphasizing very much on the coastal residents since they are our information sources. So if you look at the numbers, even though we have over like 18,000 participants, but the number is far from enough. We need more people. And when you look at the um, stranding network that we Thailand have been involved with, we are trying also not only the domestic, but the international um, organizations who have been working together and trying very hard to save these um, rare animals of the world. So we have been um, involved with organizations such as IWC, um, IT, ISTS, the ASEAN Marine Mammal Stranding Network Protector. And I have to thank the Philippines Marine um, Mammal Stranding Networks who have actually initiated uh, for, for us in Thailand. So the master plans are divided into four areas that we are 
trying to work with. So the first one is that we are emphasizing on a species, trying to let them die less and then increase the population. Uh, and you all know that the most important thing is that we have to restore the habitat. And in order to do that, we have to um, look at the public awareness. We are trying very hard to convince and try to encourage the government and all the state's operation to try to involve conservation in their policies and their practice. And this is the dream that we are hoping to come true, that we can try to save the um, endangered marine animal status. Uh, we can manage the stranding. We can get all the national, international collaboration. We can try to protect the conservation marine area and we can revive the population. And right now we are trying to prioritization on the species that has been uh, important all over the world and in Thailand. And this is, would be the success in our conservation. Uh, for conclusion, I would like to add a note that in order to accelerate the conservation success, we are trying very hard to use advanced technology as you have seen in Dr. Gongkit's presentation to assist um, in the evaluation of marine endangered uh, species status. We've been using aerial survey, drone, UAV, and acoustic tracking with satellite tagging and moni to monitor the population and dynamics. And the problem is, as you know, the cost. Uh, we are trying very hard to find that too. Uh, for to the establishment of high standard marine um, endangered species rescue um, and rehabilitation center that we, set, we have set up in Phuket, as Dr. Pacharachapon mentioned, is now one of the top facilities in Asia. And we are building another one in Rayong uh, with um, many local rescue centers, like small ones in the network. Uh, we are trying to have all these facilities to provide more support in our operations. Also, the advanced training is necessary. So we are trying to increase the training in marine forensic for veterinarians and the scientists. Also, we are trying to teach them how to make health assessment for animals in the field, which is very difficult and costly, as you know, but it is very important. We also conduct advanced research in sea turtle prosthesis, artificial reproduction, and sea turtle nesting conservation. And all of this, um, and the sea turtle prosthesis is the one thing that we are very proud of because we have involved uh, not only the biological um, aspect, but we also involved the aerodynamics, engineering, the material science, and everyone who would be uh, helping us how to make the better prosthesis for the sea turtle that has been um, injured by boat, by um, you know, fishing nets and everything else. So it has been very satisfying. And all these researches have been, has resulted in several publications, especially in genetics research. Uh, our mission possible today that we are really, really hoping that it will be a success is trying to revive the declining population of Irrawaddy Dolphin in Songkhla Lake and, and also in the Gulf of Thailand and Brutus whale and dolphins in the Eastern Gulf of Thailand. And finally, the Dugong in Trang province. To make this dream come true, we need, your, uh, we need our global collaborations because we truly believe that together we can save them. And I would like lastly to present our success in our, um, in our sea turtle prosthesis. Thank you very much. This is called the extreme plus sea turtle prosthesis. This is the beginning of the um, research experiment. This sea turtle has been cut off, um, the arm has been cut off by the fishing net and we finally got him to wear it with comfort and now he can, um, he can use it for feeding and also swimming. But of course, this sea turtle cannot be released because um, you know, this is something plastic, but at least he can live happily um, 
with all the rest of them and can um, fight for food or, or move you know, happily inside our, our pool. I would like to thank uh, the Department of Marine and Coastal Resources for making all this possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nandrika and Dr. Pajapon. I think we, we can see a, lot of work, see a lot of work in the stranded marine and uh, marine mammals and sea turtles, mm -hmm. right? So um, next, the next topic is also very important and useful too, because um, it's about the animal health uh, monitoring. He is a wildlife veterinarian with more than 30 years of experience in understanding the health of terrestrial and marine wildlife in temperate and tropical ecosystems. Please welcome Dr. Cherry Work. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you share your slide, please? Yes. It's yes, very clear. Uh, I'll share my screen. Uh, hold on a minute. Oh, cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Oh, okay, okay, I can hear yes. you now. You can hear me now. Okay, great. Uh, I'm going to share. Can Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Not yet. No. No, not yet. How about now? Okay. Okay. It's good. Thank you very much for the for the Department of Marine Conservation to allow me to present this material. Uh, my name is Terry Work. I, I'm I'm with the National Wildlife Health Center. We're based in Honolulu, Hawaii. And we work with uh, biologists and managers to try to help recover endangered species in terrestrial and marine ecosystems. So some of what we do is technical assistance like training and outreach and uh, necropsies of animals to determine cause of death. And we also do applied research. And really everything is done to help biologists and managers manage your wildlife resources. So you know, a lot of times, um, we work throughout the Pacific. So some of these are, are, are the locations in, of US territories where we do work. And then also the blue locations, which are non-US places where we've also done some work on different uh, wildlife species. Uh, we work on a variety of different organisms, uh, marine, marine mammals, sea turtles, seabirds, land birds, fish, marine invertebrates, and coral and algae. Uh, my focus today is going to be on sea turtles because that seems to be the focus of this workshop. And uh, this gives you a map of the Hawaiian Islands. And the sea turtles in Hawaii, uh, the main, major species we have are the green turtles. And they, they nest mainly in French frigate shoals. And then the, when they hatch, they go to the main Hawaiian Islands where they become adults and recruit to the near shore foraging pastures. We don't really know where the pelagic stage is, where the immatures, uh, you know, when, when turtles hatch, they go out to sea for five to seven years, and we really don't know where they go in the pelagic environment. So there's two ways to look at, at, at marine organisms. Uh, they have a near shore phase life stage, and they have a pelagic life stage. And uh, stranded turtles, are what informs the health of near shore populations. And one of the big diseases we, one of the biggest causes of mortalities we have in, in sea turtles in Hawaii are, is marine turtle fibropapillomatosis. And this is a disease that causes tumors on turtles, external tumors and internal tumors. And in Hawaii, it's very unique. They also develop these oral tumors. So this is a photograph of a tumors in the mouth which causes all sorts of problems. And we spent a lot of time trying to develop uh, tools to understand the pathogenesis and the ecology of this disease. So this, this disease is, is associated with a virus called chelonid herpes virus 5. And because we haven't until recently been able to grow this virus in laboratory, it's been very difficult to try to understand how this virus might play a role in causing disease. We can detect this virus by PCR 
but we've had to develop other tools to really understand how this virus works in causing in, in disease pathogenesis. So one of the things we did is we had, because we couldn't grow this virus in the lab is we used molecular tools to sequence the virus. And then once we had the viral sequences, we could pick certain proteins of this virus to, to, to basically develop proteins in immunized mice with these proteins. And this allowed us to probe turtle tumors with this virus, with these antibodies, to show that this virus is actually associated with the tumor. So this photomicrograph on the left is a histo histology slide of a turtle tumor. And this photograph on the right is a slide where we reacted this tumor with mouse antibodies to turtle to virus proteins. And you can see that the, 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 the tumors are lighting up, showing that the virus is actually in the turtles. And by doing this technique, we're able to show that the way this virus gets around is it's shed in the tumors. So what happens is when the tumors grow, the virus grows in the tumors and sheds in the environment. And, and what, what's happening is that when you look at fire, turtles of fibropapilloma, only about 20% of tumor turtles shed the virus. And they are accounting for 80% of the spread of this virus in the environment. So you have these super spreaders, these animals with tumors that shed the environment and shed the virus in large amounts in the environment and infect all sorts of other turtles. So these are super spreaders. We also know that with time, the immune system, as these, as these tumors get worse and worse in the animal, these animals become immunosuppressed. And then as a result of this immunosuppression, they become colonized with opportunistic bacteria like Vibrio. So we found that fibropapillomatosis leads to immunosuppression and opportunistic bacterial infections. Um, because we can't uh, grow the virus, or we could not grow the virus in the lab until very recently, it was one of the really big things we wanted to know is, is what is the exposure status? When are animals becoming exposed and when are they getting antibodies to the virus? So in order to do that, we had to develop ways to, to detect total antibodies. So we, we raised monoclonal antibodies to, to total immunoglobulins, again, using mice. And then again, we, we, we looked at different viral proteins and we were able to express these viral proteins in, in what's called the baculovirus expression vector. So it's basically a way to grow the virus proteins in the lab. And using these reagents, we were able to show that we were able to detect the total immune response to the virus. So this graph here shows you increasing viral, increasing tumor severity in turtles. And on the y-axis is the amount of antibodies that these turtles produce against the virus. And as you can see, with turtles from Hawaii, where this turtle, where this disease has been very well studied, the more tumors they get, the more, the more antibodies to the virus they develop. And in Florida, in the Eastern United States, which is another area where this disease is present and has been very intensively studied, you can see that with increasing tumors, there's the, the virus, the, the antibody levels, the viruses kind of flattens out and plateaus. And so that, that kind of shows that the immune response of these turtles in different geographic areas will differ according to the geographic area. So that, that really highlights that just because you see a disease like fibropapillomatosis in a given area, the animals in that geographic area may respond very differently to the virus, depending on the geography of, of, of where the disease is occurring. We recently were able to develop ways to grow this virus in the lab. So typically when you grow viruses in, in laboratory, what you do is you grow these, you grow animal cells in the Petri dish, and then you grow the virus in the animal cells. But that technique has not worked with this virus in sea turtles. So what we had to do is we had to, we had to basically grow turtle skin in the lab in a Petri dish. So we, we seeded uh, Petri dishes with fibroblast. We then came back with turtle skin cells. And then we, 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 we raised those cultures in the air water interface. 
And by doing that, we were able to grow actual turtle skin in the lab. And by actually growing turtle skin in the lab, this allowed us to grow the virus. So this virus can only grow in a laboratory in the three-dimensional tissue culture matrix, which is kind of complicated to do. But it also shows that when you look at virus development in a three-dimensional tissue culture system, you can see the way the virus develops, which is very different than the way people normally look at viruses. And so this, this kind of highlights that if you really want to understand virus production and virus morphology and virus pathogenesis, you have to look at, at tissue culture in the three-dimensional system, not just in the flat Petri dish with a sheet of cells. We also have an interest in what's happening in the pelagic environment, but with pelagic turtles, it's very difficult. Recall that we don't really know what happens with pelagic turtles when they hatch and go out to sea. So one way we can get a handle on that is we can look at turtles that are bicot in the pelagic longline fisheries. And in the US, longline fisheries are required to bring dead turtles that they catch back to the mainland so we can do necropsies on them. And by doing that, we can see that pelagic turtles don't have any parasites and they don't have any fibropapillomatosis, which tells us that they probably acquire parasites and fibropapillomatosis once they recruit to the near shore foraging pastures. We've also shown with another species of turtles that uh, Olive Ridley turtles, that uh, they have an infection with salmonellosis that causes renal disease in these animals. And this, this, can, this salmonella bacteria can cause significant strandings on the west coast of the United States. And we found that we also see this, these bacteriums and these lesions in the kidneys in pelagic turtles that are in, in, the, in the bycatch fisheries. And this is very unusual in the sense that this salmonella is very host specific to all of Ridley turtles, which is kind of unusual for salmonella bacteria. So this has been a really quick overview of, of looking at, at tools that we develop to look at disease in sea turtles, but these tools can be applied to a variety of different animals. And, and this has been a collaborative effort among many institutions. And I'd like to thank you for your interest and that's all I have, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Terry Ward. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. So I would like to move forward to our next uh, speaker. So because uh, today we invite Dr. Ellen Hyde from USA. Uh, her research has raised the population and community eco ecology of threats and endangered species incorporating local conservation effort and regional scale coastal and uh, marine management. And her presentation today are entitled The International Collaboration and Research on Marine Mammal by Cash. Please welcome Dr. Ellen Hines. Greetings, everybody. Thank you, Pete Ong. And thank you, everybody. I'm so glad to see so many of you. And I miss you all. Stay well, everybody out there. Just have to say that. Um, <clears throat> I've been lucky enough to work with the DMCR and many people here for quite a few years, I think since 1999. And I am honored to have been asked to speak at this uh, Decade Action Incubator. I'll be talking uh, about <clears throat> how it all began, how I started in my work and all the wonderful people I've been working with, uh, beginning with uh, the work that I did when I first met uh, Dr. Conquette and Dr. Kanjana in Phuket in 1999, of course, and many others. Um, but I'd, I'd also like to move forward from there um, through some of the work that we began 
working on the western and then the eastern Gulf Coast of Thailand, working with dugongs and Irrawaddy dolphins. And bringing together a lot of people to um, train from throughout Southeast Asia and South Asia. And I think at one point we had people from 10 different countries on our research trips. And to me, that is, is my dream is to, like Dr. Konkiet said, and, and um, also Dr. Pacharapan and Dr. Nantarika, it is very important that people work together across national boundaries that of course these animals do not recognize. <clears throat> but then I'd like to talk about our project getting to the bottom of bycatch. And to me, that really uh, showed this kind of international cooperation. And, and there were some wonderful people, as you can see from Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, and, and a few of us Americans, North Americans who came along um, in creating a toolbox. And, and what, we, what we are is basically an interdisciplinary international team working to reduce marine mammal bycatch. And I want to, of course, acknowledge all of our in-country collaborators. <clears throat> our, um, oops, excuse me. Our study areas included the eastern Gulf Coast of Thailand in Trap Province, uh, Kian Giang Biosphere Reserve in Vietnam, the Cebu Tingi Islands of Peninsular Malaysia, and Kuching Bay in Sarawak. And our rationale then was that there are these limited resources for scientists in many countries. We've heard that from, from Dr. John and again from everybody. But we say that scarce data and poor understanding are no excuse for hindered progress. By the time we get all the data that we think we need, we might not have the animals left at all. So we need to work towards what I, I like to call a risk assessment to identify, analyze, and um, evaluate the likelihood or probability of an event happening and to look at its consequences. And what we did is we created a spatially explicit risk analysis um, in these areas where data were often inadequate. So the, the BIRA, the bycatch risk assessment tool is a freely downloadable modeling framework that um, is based on the methods and applications from these two papers, um, which I'm, I'm glad to put in the chat for anybody, <clears throat> looking at our work in these five Southeast Asian fisheries. And BIRA can be used with uh, a free QGIS or ArcGIS if it's available, and it's downloadable from the Invest Model Suite tools that are part of the National Capital Project out of Stanford University. And this first step is, of course, um, some sort of fisherman surveys or participatory mapping, or as we did in TROT, we had the formal line transect surveys or aerial surveys, or it could be from uh, working together with experts or looking at the literature. But first of all, we need the sightings of the animals and the fishing locations and the kind of gear and the seasons used. And in uh, Thailand and in, in Vietnam, we went around and talked to the experts who we were working with and other people from agencies and listed the different fishing gear that was used. The next step in Byra then is creating a layer of species distribution if we have enough data, we can use our satellite data or animal data points used, gathered from interviews. In some cases, we use MaxSend as a suitability model. Um, it's, it's a presence only model that's suitable for small sample sizes to model habitat use. 
And here is um, Trot. There is Mung Trot. Sorry, I can't roll my R's. <laughs> um, but here we're looking at um, habitat suitability in both on the left in the wet season and on the right in the dry season. And here also is our uh, suitability. This is again for Irrawaddy dolphins and Kiangyang, the biosphere reserve in Vietnam, where we had very little data and we had to depend on expert knowledge from people in various agencies and fisheries. The next step of BIRA is take the species layer and use it as input along with the stressors. Now the stressors then are defined as the gear specific fishing areas. And we can define several or as many um, categories of fishing gear as we need to. And so here, again, this is on the left, the uh, wet season in trap in the dry season in trout. And these are from our um, five years of uh, boat based surveys. And again, in Vietnam, where there's very little data, we talk to many people in the, the biosphere reserve office, fisheries offices, and uh, people in commercial fisheries to generate these maps. So we do the best that we can. And fully to round out the model, we use a table for incorporating expert opinion and previous literature to rate the impact of gear to the species. So our gear ratings are based on both the exposure of the animal to the gear and the consequences of an animal getting caught For the consequence, we have both sensitivity and resilience. For resilience, we assess the species and we look at understanding the biological factors <clears throat> that can make a population more resilient if bycatch were to happen to an individual. And that could be age, maturity, reproductive strategy, local species status, or population connectivity. So here's an example, then um, let's look at surface gill nets. And this is generally what this table portion looks like for input into the bio toolkit. So we have our exposure, the spatial overlap of deer and animals, intensity, likelihood of interaction with species, and temporal soak time, Temporal overlap, likelihood of capture by deer, and the current status of any management actions. Sensitivity would be um, the possibility of mortality to this animal if it does get caught, and the life stage is affected by deer if known. And these require ratings from one to three, and this is usually a conversation with local scientists. Now, based on the GIS layers, we have these four spatially explicit, uh, sorry, these three spatially explicit criteria that we'll look at next. So the spatially explicit criteria that we use in most cases, and uh, for the rest of this talk, I'll be depending on some work that we just completed off the uh, northern coast of Peru, our maps based on, on fishing intensity, the likelihood, and like the fishing intensity is used as a proxy for the number of vessels in the water using gear at a specific time. The likelihood of gear species interactions is an overlay of the species distribution layer and the fishing intensity layer. And the temporal overlap and sink of soak time is based on the number of hours fishing gear soaks in the water. So once we run this model using our gear ratings, 
we return to our, our stakeholders in each country and present these maps, then we had to see, did we get it right? Does this look reasonable to you? Um, then we, we, want, we run the model to build our final synthesis, which is management recommendations. But before we really get into our results, we needed a way to address the uncertainty in our data inputs and outputs. We used the data standards based on Heinz et al. 2020, where we worked together in a group, all of our, our Asian scientists collaborators, to create a stoplight approach that delineated which criteria we needed to give us the best data, sufficient data, or caution and courage because we really didn't have a lot of data. And what you can see is that in many cases, let's say for dugongs in, in um, we looked at dugongs in uh, the Cebu Tingi Islands at the eastern coast of peninsula in Malaysia. We only had enough uh, interviews for our animal sightings criteria and very little bycatch stranding data. Okay. And then our data output, our indication of uncertainty was then put on each map. So again, for Peru, this will give you a good idea of the bycatch risk map. And this is for humpback whales in our study area. So, as it appears, the entire study area does have bycatch risk, highlighting a higher risk nearer to the coast. This aligns with the whale's migratory route and a higher fishing density. Our stoplight shows green and yellow to signal low to medium uncertainty in the results. What I also want to point out here is that we're able to create uh, subregions by distance from shore to show the different results in, and also A, B, and C are different projected protected areas that um, people are proposing along the coast of the world. So what we are able to show then are gear risk percentages for the subzones divided by distance from shore. So these graphs are split by gear type with the zones going closest to shore, the artisanal fishery zone, similar to in Thailand, um, and the amount of risk associated with the gear. As you move away from the coast, there is less risk, but the highest risk is still from surface and bottom drillings. Then Byro produces ratings for the exposure and consequence of possible gear interactions. While the humpback whales have similar exposure to most gear types, the worst consequences for the humpbacks are from bottom and surface gill nets, where they are mostly exposed to both gill nets and long nets. For the three protected areas, there is some high risk in each zone, mainly contributing from gill nets. The medium risk is prevalent for bottom long nets. <clears throat> in Arecetes de Pondosa in El Nero, but the cursing is uh, also pretty risky in the Banco de Mancora, which is further offshore. So these are results that we are able to get from the bycatch toolbox. And, oops, sorry. Um, <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Can Can you hear that? How How many uh, How many presentation you uh, left? I know. I don't know how to turn that off. Yeah. I'm so oh, sorry wait. that yeah. I have to return. Okay. okay. Hold Hold on one going. sec. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Thank okay. you. Turn that off. There we go. All right. Let's try that again. I apologize. So this yeah. research, yeah. yeah, this is okay. Okay. 
Okay, I'm almost done. <laughs> I'll be in time. Oh. oh, so we do identify these areas of high back thickness, provide seasonal risk maps, initiates an organized conservation on bycatch, supports development of NPAs, uses low cost methods, free software, and we provide local training, and values fishermen knowledge and input. To me, what's most important here are the conversations that we're able to have with local scientists, local fishermen, and people in different agencies. And here are just some of the workshops that we've been able to do in India, Malaysia, the Philippines, one of my favorite at Phuket, and in Vietnam. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Allen. It's very good to have you uh, here. And maybe the, the audience will feel like uh, Today we have all speakers that have very different different uh, experts. But however, uh, for we we come together today because we have uh, the same goal. We try to conserve the marine mammal and sea turtle, but it came from the basic knowledge. So thank you so much, Ellen. So uh, I would pleasure. like to move. I, I would like to move to uh, next pre next uh, presentation. Uh, the this presentation uh, from Dr. Dipani, she has been studying uh, Eurovigi dolphin in Chilika Lagoon in the eastern of India. So, and today is very special special day for her because today is uh, her birthday. And uh, I would like to say uh, thank you so much for uh, for for pay your time for this meeting. Please welcome uh, Dr. Kipani Sutaria, please. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me and for wishing me and I hope everybody has a wonderful day and the conference is successful. Um, so I am going to start sharing my screen and hopefully I will know to do this properly in one second. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, so I'll just uh, enlarge it now. Um, one second. Sorry. So all we seniors have learned how to use all this technology because of COVID. <laughs> there. Okay, you can see my entire slide. Yes. Okay. All right. So thank you so much for inviting me to the conference. And uh, as I was told that I should try and cover um, subjects that cover population estimation, I have just changed my slide. I've not gone into details of the methods, but I've just give, I'm just giving you an overview of how things have happened in India using different lines of inquiry, different methods of inquiry. Okay. Um, so we've recently found out probably just in the past two decades that uh, there are at least 30, 30, 31 different species of cetaceans. I'm not going into the wrongs at all uh, in Indian waters. And uh, as you'll see, we've, or we've, we've had our first record of razors, dolphins after researchers have been out of water. We've had our first records of Omura's whales, uh, of the Arabian Sea humpback whales. And uh, so I'll just go into the process of how we have been doing these things. And different projects are doing it in different places. Over here, you have resource dolphins, Iravari dolphins, killer whales, um, striped dolphins, traces dolphins, and this is from east and west coast of India. So what are the challenges we face in India? I think South and Southeast Asia are very similar in terms of, uh, you know, our cultures, of course, our cultures and science, and then the kind of challenges we face. We are very, very, very similar. And uh, so there's a huge gap in scientific data as all the other talks have already said. And uh, apart from when I say scientific data, it's life history data, it's population stuff, it's you know everything. We've not had cruises like the way the, the developed nations have had like America and Noah and all. When they do cruises, they have enough finances and enough logistics in place to carry them out. In India, we just don't have that. 
and sometimes justifying the cost of a, of a large vessel survey uh, is something that not all of us agree with. So we do have very huge uh, gaps in scientific data collection. We also have these other things going on where we have gaps in legislation, we have mismatch going on between all the different agencies that are involved in one side wildlife and biodiversity protection and on the other side increasing the yield of fisheries right so there is a constant mismatch happening between in the government itself then there is this lack of trust between people who are at the ground level or at sea all the time basically fishermen uh, and administering offices there's a huge untapped potential of local knowledge systems. You know, this is a post-colonial thing, sorry, but it's just that we've lost so much of our traditional knowledge. And um, just about all our projects now include this because there's a lot of traditional local knowledge that in, even in terms of climate change, you know, people have seen out and see how things have changed over the past 60 years. So people kind of know more if you would ask them. Um, and finally, in India, we still don't have any university or any institution offering any courses in marine mammal science. Uh, it, it's been in the pipeline for a very long time, but it's still not happening. Um, okay, next slide. So what are the, let's just look at, sorry, let's just look at only the first thing, only the first thing I've talked about, uh, which is the scientific data. And in scientific data, what are the kind of data gaps we use, which are really important for conservation? So the basic, basic things are species distributions, diversity, the movement patterns, and space use over seasons, right? Then, of course, you want population estimation and trends and population size. After which is life history studies, prey preference and availability, group rates, survival rates. Uh, population structures using genetic tools because is there bottlenecks going on? Is there a transmission between different uh, isolated populations or not? Somebody? So these are studies that are also required. And finally, stopping and mitigating incidental or target capture of cetaceans. So if you go back in our series of talks, I realized that you know Ellen was looking at the last point slightly. And uh, there was somebody who looked at uh, from Hawaii who was looking at life history studies and uh, you know, the stranding response network can lead to like this life history studies, prey preference, growth rate and survival rates. So my next slide will then be only about the first and second uh, data gaps, the population parameters, right? So what are we using? What do we use? We use two types of methods even for this. Uh, one is the qualitative method, which is your participatory informant networks or your interview surveys and your focal group discussions. So we use these um, even in India. And then there are quantitative methods, which are your line transect surveys, which are vessel or shore-based uh, surveys using distance methods. There's mark recapture using photo identification surveys. And we also do passive acoustic monitoring, static and toad arrays. So we are trying to use all these at the moment in different locations, different PhD students uh, are using uh, some of these methods. Just a, a glimpse into, into the kind of line transect surveys, we, we hire trawlers like this and we convert them into our platforms for doing distance based surveys. And this method is now being used in, uh, we also use ferries, inter-island ferries, which travel on the same route. So it's a uniform line. Um, and so we use both those platforms of opportunity. Uh, and papers have been published using these methods uh, in Orissa, in Andaman Nicobar and in Lakshadweep. Uh, using uh, distance phase line transects. This is something that uh, was done in Cochin by Panikar, where she was doing shore-based surveys of reticles and also had some very good data that you could gather on, on space use and dolphin density in a small area, which is an area you can see here. Uh, it is tourism, it is fisheries, it's, uh, it's shipping, it's CNG. Uh, it has all kinds of activities going on inside this harbor. And then there's a population of humpback dolphins that visit or spend time there. Then uh, something that uh, is close to my heart is the photo ID. Uh, we have not succeeded in using this method in any other species as yet in India, sadly. So we, it's, it's been used only with the Iravadi dolphins in Chilka Lagoon. We tried doing this in Song Club, but there, are no, there were no animals there at that time. Um, um, and we have published, I've published from this, of course, the data. We had about 80 dolphins, and this is some of the, I think, some of the best quality data one can have for uh, closed or isolated, like, isolated populations that are well marked 
Of course, all these methods come with their own list of assumptions uh, that have to be met. So uh, of course, if your animals are not well marked like these are, then using this method becomes very difficult. But uh, this also is not just about population estimation. Uh, you know, it can also be used for things like site fidelity, home ranges for each of these individuals, and then uh, studying so kinship and social structures also. Uh, so there's a lot of that goes into this method and it is it does remain one of my most favorite methods to use. Then finally, this is something we've recently started probably in the last four years. Um, this is Isha, you're studying finless porpoise. Uh, so her PhD is looking at how to customize your um, array and your methods for analysis to try and figure out the density of finless porpoises. And this is open ocean um, along the west coast of India. And uh, she now uses a toad array. Um, and this is some of the data that she has managed to find out. So her, as you can see, each, each color over here is a different individual. But visually, when we counted the animals, there were only three animals. And these are all um, of different bearings from underwater that the array got uh, signals from, for clicks for, from the finless porpoises. So this is a very good uh, method. You have to, of course, have correction factors in place and we have recently started this. But I certainly think that for elusive and rare species, uh, passive acoustic monitoring is probably the best way to figure out what your actual density of animals is. Um, this is uh, looking at the blue whales and the humpback whales. This is also passive acoustic monitoring that they're using, not just for presence, absence, and space use. We now have recorders in three locations along the west coast of India. Um, and um, it's not just for presence, absence. If you're lucky, like if you, if you look at the left side, these are blue whales. They have different singing notes. So what you see here is a, is a singing note. And uh, what you see here is a foraging one. And, uh, it's, uh, and basically there are at least two individuals over here. Uh, this is what we found out from the passive acoustic monitoring. Um, I will not put on the sound because it's a humpback whale singing. Uh, then that's Abhishek over there who started going out on fishing vessels to collect data on encounters with uh, dolphins. Um, uh, what we do from these things is not only immerse ourselves in the fishermen's life and their way of living out at sea for 20 days, they spend time with us also. So when we say participatory informal network, when we say involving or including fishing communities, we don't mean just doing interviews with them. We actually mean going out and being with them and becoming part of their lives so that they can also become part of ours. And uh, most of the people who do these things actually do it with or in India right now are doing it with that perspective. So we teach, uh, the, uh, the fishermen know that the, there are these large pods of dolphins, but which one is which is what you can actually, you know, if, even if you find one fisherman on the vessel of uh, 20 who wants to start identifying, then it makes a huge difference to our data set. Uh, this is another way of doing participatory informant work where you act, you're on the right, I'm sitting with fishing communities, um, in, the, in Gujarat, up over there, we are sitting with officers and tourist, dolphin tourist operators in Goa. So these are the kind of workshops and meetings we try, and try to hold at least every two months with the communities. As, as you know, the country is huge, uh, but luckily we have local teams working everywhere. Um, so it's not like one team has to run around. And then we find out things like these. So there are dolphin, there are whale temples in some parts of the West Coast of India. We consider at least the large whales to be a blessing from God. Uh, and so collecting data for us has now just got, for the large whales has now just started. And we are very thankful to the fishermen for actually taking the effort to do so. This is a very cute, I would like you to hear it. You won't understand the language, but you might understand the, it's an interview going on. And at the end of it, uh, I'm asking him, have you ever heard a whale when you were out fishing? And so this is uh, what he sings for us. <laughs> so what he was doing was he was he was trying to describe the sound of the whale and then the fact that you don't have to be scared of them. They just come around the boat 
they look at you and then they go away on their own. So that is what he was saying over there. And then other participatory networks are also divers and free divers. Um, so if you can hear this, I'm not sure if you can. Um, you, they, they're part of our network also. Uh, when he goes down, you hear uh, a sound. That was one of our li first live uh, songs recorded on the water. I don't know if you can hear. Yeah. And, uh, and then this is a fishing community. This was just three days ago. We have a beautiful sighting from the fishermen of our first arrival of the Hampas Rail on the West Coast of India. But you know, reaching this point, reaching this point in, uh, in participatory work and the community area is a lot of work, a lot of effort. And the first and foremost is the well being of the fishermen. Uh, without their trust, uh, you know, these things would not be possible. So what do we do with all this kind of uh, participatory data? As you'll see over here, on, it was very difficult to figure out where to put the, put the sound recorders, right? You might have money to buy sound recorders, but you've got to put them in the right places. So we used all the interview surveys and all the participatory information network data and mapped these areas. And we decided that, well, we are not working in this area because of security reasons, but at least the, this area is where, and we have recorders in these three locations. So this is how we basically did not do the very finance, financially heavy logistics, heavy uh, boat-based surveys. I'm sure it needs to be done at some point, uh, vessel-based surveys, but we did manage to put our recorders in the locations where we know the whales come across the Arabian Sea. To India. Um, so the utility of all these data sets that I have been talking about, of course, it's used in uh, conservation and population status assessments in the IUCN, uh, species protection status in India and the Wildlife Protection Act of India, uh, regional level comparisons and collaborations for species like with the Arabian Sea humpback whale, at least for the migratory species, and then for the life history, if anybody's collecting life history data or at least looking at population uh, genetic structures that can be compared uh, across the species range. Uh, very importantly, the biodiversity of assessments for marine systems, you know, when there's development projects, infrastructure projects going on, this kind of these kind of data sets are really important. Uh, so that, you know, even, even if they surpass, the, surpass all permissions and build a port, uh, there is something in the background that people, if they ever go back and look for, it's like there was data available but we didn't use it. And finally, if most of you know about the important marine mammal areas atlas, um, it's the world atlas. So uh, we've provided data even for that. And we have quite a few imams in India. There are data gaps, as you can see, huge ones. I'm hoping to fill those up uh, in the coming years. We also have now an online database, which is dynamic and uh, which can be used. It is public, it's for public, uh, it can be downloaded and used by anybody if they wish to. Uh, the database gets data from fishermen and from researchers and from NGOs. So it's everybody contributing to the database. Um, and so all these projects that I have described here, uh, I thought I had only 10 minutes, so it was quite quick, are all these different people who are either already got their PhDs or are doing their PhDs or are working in NGOs. So I'm really thankful for all of them for taking all this work ahead in their own capacity and in their own uh, passion, interest and passion, actually. And uh, my acknowledgements go out to a whole, whole range of people, starting from the funding agencies who've been very kind all these years, to the dive companies, fishing communities, and of course, all the permission granting agencies. And that is it. Look forward to questions later. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sutaria, for your sharing. It's very interesting topic, and we can get some point like a gap. So, 
we move to the next speaker. Uh, he is the research professor and deputy direction of the Q Laboratory of Marine Eco Environment Science uh, and Technology at First Institute of Oceanography. Uh, please welcome Professor Shang Sulei. Um, and I will say sorry because now we uh, time is is very tight. So I need you to wrap up in ten minutes. Okay, Sulei. Thank you so much. Okay, please welcome. Thank you, Patra. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, we can hear. Okay, we, we see your, your presentation. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. I, I, I would like to take this uh, opportunity to introduce uh, the proposal uh, under the uh, UN decade. Uh, the, the title is Smart Perception of the Marine Ecosystem. It's an idea from our teamwork. So I just did a contact person and the leading scientist. So uh, the background is on the uh, UN decade of ocean science and to identify required knowledge build capacity and increase the use of uh, knowledge, uh, ocean knowledge and understanding. And also based on the uh, global biodiversity framework post-2020 uh, on uh, SMART. And in the background also when I come from the technology uh, revolutioning the study of organisms in their natural environment, not in our lab or in our catch. And the smart function of the marine ecosystem is to effective attain knowledge on marine biodiversity, support conservation of marine ecosystem, and promote sustainable development of coastal society. We have a uh, proposal for two. Uh, one is uh, both targeted on the icons of marine biodiversity, uh, one mainly on the endangered marine mammals, and the other is also for the coral life health. So for the coral uh, Indian marine mammals, we will integrate uh, poly science and technology also with public wisdom. Firstly, for the Indian marine mammals, we will involve public uh, wisdom by uh, designing the apps, mobile apps for reporting the sighting events. This is uh, many uh, language varieties. Also, we use the uh, no uh, new uh, technology like uh, marine uh, environmental DNA to study the genetics of, by using the non-invasive sampling. And also we will use the UAV as Dr. Gunkert and colleagues mentioned already as a normal uh, height from the sky to for the population size and behaviors and how range so on. And also use the satellite telemetry to migrate and uh, connectivity studies. Also for the uh, distribution and habitat sensors, we will use more advanced technology such as the USV uh, in the coastal area because of the limit uh, limitation of the battery. And also on the, uh, with the unmanned sailboat on the uh, right bottom, uh, because it uh, almost uh, endless for an um, unlimited with uh, power supply. It can be used both for the marine and coastal area sensors. For the uh, coral life health, we will also use the species uh, richness uh, diagnosis uh, from the environmental DNA method. And also we will involve public watching, uh, public uh, involvement by uh, sharing the, the, the uh, life uh, images and uh, videos uh, to the public from the onsite. And the, uh, the merits of the uh, smart protection of the marine ecosystem is to contribute to the decade uh, five uh, major outcomes, including a predicted ocean and uh, an accessible ocean, an inspiring and uh, engaging ocean, a pr productive ocean, and a healthy and a resilient ocean. We have already uh, made a consolidated foundation for our proposal. 
uh, like uh, during the past years, we have been conducting the uh, so-called the MISTA project, the regional study of marine endangered species, including mammals and sea turtles in the tropical Asia for effective conservation and the uh, US uh, uh, and the uh, respect. Uh, we have uh, developed the, what do we call the WALA framework. The WALA framework borrows the idea conception from the traditional medicine that is to propose the people's uh, problem. Uh, we use the watch to uh, the optic method like the sightseeing and the uh, photo ID and ask like the social service to the local uh, knowledge system and listen uh, using the acoustic, bioacoustic methods and analysis, analysis of uh, big data and samples and information to, to get the result. Uh, this is uh, the framework to, we think we can uh, uh, all, uh, uh, wrap up all the existing and the developing methods and can be addressed uh, to you, to, to, use to address the problem uh, for getting uh, data uh, from, for the uh, indigenous mammals in the ocean. Uh, also, our projects have uh, various partners from this region, including, uh, not, not limited to uh, colleagues from Thailand, like uh, GMTR, uh, Malaysia, like the UMT, uh, UM, uh, UMS, Indonesia, uh, the Maritime University of Umrah, and uh, Cambodia, Brunei, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, partners from this also of this region and also uh, China. Uh, we have been uh, uh, implementing our method on dugong, Ilavadi dolphin, finless purpose, cross whale, and sea turtle studies. We have uh, developed uh, artificial intelligence for high throughput analysis of marine mammal images to assist our data purpose. Also, we developed artificial intelligence method for high throughput analysis of marine mammal sound. So both sounds and images can be processed and analyzed uh, efficiently. And we have been using the, uh, integrating the uh, advanced uh, platform uh, by using the USB, the unmanned service boat, and UAV grant as a multi-platform to study dolphins and dugong. Here are just two examples in Andamansi in, uh, in the Brown province coast and also the Bay of Brunei. Uh, we have been using the UAV photograph to show the uh, spatial displacement of uh, dugongs and green turtles in their grazing ground. Also to present their population information on dugongs and green turtles. Also, we use the power method from the uh, clicking sound of the Ilavadi dolphin to do their hotspots, both uh, spatially and also temporarily. Uh, here, I also uh, present the example that from the clicking sound from the Ilavadi dolphin, we can uh, infer their response to impacts of both and information uh, interference. We have also identified the uh, common results of Ilavadi dolphin. And we use a uh, uh, satellite telemetry to track various uh, animal migration, such as uh, the broad whale in the Gulf of Thailand, and the turtles, there's a uh, hawkbill from the Gulf of Thailand, and also the green turtle from the Anamati area. And we have, using the, we have been using the DNA method to do the connectivity of green turtles from various management units. And our results show that the Bay uh, of Brunei is a major foraging ground for green turtles from the Southeast Asia region, representing its importance in the area. So uh, that's uh, my proposal, uh, our proposal and we look forward to your support and welcome to you uh, to join our cooperation. And I would like to welcome questions and comments. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, thank you, Professor Zhang, so for your nice talk and show a lot of new technique to to uh, conserve the animals. So last but not least, um, the net and the network is the key for the stranded animals rescue and providing the sightseeing of the citizens as well as the total data. The next speaker is the president of the Philippines Marine Mammal Stranding Network uh, and has been working on marine mammals since uh, the 1990s. Please welcome Professor Lemuel Agornes. Okay, so can you see the slide, right? Yes. Okay. We can see. Okay. Start. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or good day. Thank you for inviting me for this special talk. Today I'll be talking about the Philippine Marine Mammal Stranding Network, value of genuine engagement and networking. I am Lem Aragones, president of the Philippine Marine Mammal Stranding Network and a, currently the, a professor at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. First of all, the Philippines it's an archipelago of 7,641 islands. So it's a relatively large um, island nation, archipelagic nation. And the, um, our nation is divided administratively, meaning for administrative purposes, to, uh, into 17 regions of which 15 have coast. And take note, the Philippines has a humongous amount of coastline. We are the fifth long, we have the fifth longest coastline in the world, mounting to about 36,289 kilometers. So you can see here the boundaries of the different regions in the Philippines. And in the Philippines, we have we are fortunate to have at least 30 marine mammal species, of which 29 are cetaceans, whales, and dolphins. We do not have any porpoise and the dugong. And these are the photos of some of the examples, pinner dolphin, melonhead whale, rhesus dolphin, spotted dolphin, and the dugong. And they do strand. Okay, so unfortunately, they strand, and that's the reason why we form the Philippine Marine Mammal Stranding Network. In 2003, there was an interagency workshop was held at Ocean Adventure Subic. It is a marine theme park. In 2004, partnership between BIFAR, the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources, and the owners of Ocean Adventure for capacity building and development programs for marine mammal conservation. And by 2005, its first project was to establish or to um, conduct the first national workshop on marine mammal stranding response. And in 2006, the second national workshop was also held in Ocean Adventure. Starting later part of 2006, we started doing the regional training for, uh, starting with region two. And by the year 2007, the expansion of the Philippine Marine Mammal Stranding Networks began. And by 2009, the establishment of the memorandum of agreements uh, between the MMSN and regional uh, offices of the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources started. <clears throat> So what is the PMMSN? PMMSN is a SEC registered group of professionals and volunteers throughout the Philippines committed to responding to stranded marine mammals, dead or alive. So our main objectives are two, to 
correspond in the context of the individual stranders or strand, mass stranded uh, animals in the context of their welfare or the well animal welfare and also to collect data and that is these are the two main objectives of the network the core organization members meaning these are the, the ones that started um, help build establish establish this network the academy is the university of the philippines institute of environmental science and meteorology where i belong the national government agencies such as the bureau of fisheries and aquatic resources the department of environment and natural resources an ngo wildlife in need and a private corporation of course as i mentioned ocean adventure is who started uh, to share the technology <clears throat> PMMSN has, has been organized in various levels, regional, the provinces or provincial and local, local government units, be it the cities or towns. Currently, we have uh, certified 4,562 first responders. So these are the number of our certified members nationwide. So as you can see, we train, we continue to train. I mean, we've been responding and we continue to respond. And that's the main context of the message of the genuine uh, engagement uh, that this network would like to share to the group. Here in this photo, you can see that I am demonstrating using a human example as a humanoid dolphin <clears throat> in, along the beach. And here is an example of a rough tooth dolphin that we were rehabilitating. <clears throat> In this case, we rehabilitated this animal for 50 days before it was released. So the story is simple. We started training and the training sort of was slow at the start. We were established in 2005, October 2005, first training. And so the request of trainings increased. These are the number of trainings per year. Okay. And uh, right now we are, uh, are already conducting the 123rd training. So you can see that uh, out of these trainings through the years, we have acquired the 4,560. And therefore we've been training small groups for ranging from sometimes 30 to approximately about 70. But in the advent of this pandemic, we've been, uh, been able to increase it in the context of via Zoom um, as a webinar series. So these um, are the number of uh, chapters. We have a humongous number of, but take note, 85, but 15 are regional chapters. And that's all of the coastal provinces have uh, PMMSN chapters. And there have been We've been very fortunate to deal with rare species such as the ginkgo toothed whale here and uh, uh, longman's beak whale. We've been able to produce manuals to enhance our training and our response, been able to develop a field guide to help out the responders. We even have been able to publish because the, the UP has been the research arm of this national stranding network. We've been able to conduct annually um, national symposia. And this is the main objective of this national symposia is to share our experiences, build consensus, share results, and fortunate also, most importantly, to build the network. And right now, because of such strong network, we've been able to almost record um all the strandings nationwide and you can see that um we started small numbers we probably this is probably an artifact of the people being um able to recognize that they have to report they've been educated to report the uh, strandings um but somehow starting 2014, more or less the, the stranding incidents or the frequency have uh, settled. 
So we have that as an evidence of our stranding network growth. We've been able to also generate a powerful map using our cheese, uh, using um, fish coral reeds to identify hotspots in the Philippines. And these are the reeds of 15 kilometers by 15 kilometers. See the, 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 the various color codes here for frequency of strandings in such area. We've been able to gather also a, a, a humongous amount of information particularly the species composition of our marine mammals in the Philippines. And therefore, I would like to thank you guys and uh, also like to pitch in through this network, uh, the Philippine Marine Mammal Stranding Network. We've been also able to uh, assist people who have similar strandings in uh, for, uh, the whale shark as well as sea turtles. I hope you learned something today. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Len. Uh, he may not be here with us, but his presentation is very interesting and effectively. So we're lucky that we have 20 minutes left. So for this, uh, for this time, we have to uh, go to the discussion. We have the opportunities to listen to the experts from the marine mammal and sea turtle sisters for this discussion, I will in together go to define the important issues and recommendation about the future plan for conservation action. So I think uh, we would like to listen from the floor, the question from the floor. If uh, anyone has the question, uh, Please raise your hand. And because uh, we also have the list of the topic that uh, like a gap of our research in our regions. So the, the list, the list of the topics is uh, like a research in the trans boundaries areas so it's the one is so we are not to uh like a gap of data and we don't have the project yet or the training program that can be improved our staff and our acknowledge so if, if no one raised the hand i would like to ask the the speakers dr kongkian could you please give our recommendation for what kind of the research or what kind of the project we can do together for uh, in the next 10 years? Yes, I Thank did you. not expect that question for me. <laughs> Actually, it should be convenient. Yeah, but uh, as, as we all heard about the that uh, many speakers talking about research, talking about uh, the things that they have done and talking about what we should do next. I think by now, it's just only that, uh, how can we have a platform or any, any, any mechanism, me mechanisms that we can share the data together and those data can be used in common uh, for, for all of us uh, for conservation management. So that is the key point that we should have, I think. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for, for your recommendation. I, I think if uh, no, no have uh, the audience to give the question, may I would like to ask uh, the next speakers are Dr. John, could you please give us recommendation for our uh, next, uh, next step. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. Hi, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, um, I guess 
Uh, the only thing I could recommend at this stage is like, if we continue what we have been doing in the past decade, we have been very good, at least in our small network in Southeast Asia. Uh, we've been very good at keeping connected, uh, staying connected and um, organizing workshops and trainings together to be able to enhance our knowledge and skills in marine mammal research and sea and conservation. Um, for example, I guess what we've been talking about this for some years now, uh, having the next CMAM symposium could be one, um, yes. one recommendation, I think, that I could give. Yeah. I hope it happens soon. Yes, the pandemic is still upon us, but maybe in the next year or so, it could finally happen. Yeah. Right. Well, very good, because I think if we propose this uh, next step to UN, maybe they can one of the our support or some sponsor our mid uh, conference, CMEM conference. Mm -hmm. I, I will highlight this one also. So next one, please, uh, Dr. Nantrika. Dr. Nantrika, please give us the uh, recommendation. Thank you very much. Um, I have to close. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. I, I would love to, to see your face without mask. <laughs> okay. First of all, I would like to congratulate on the success of this symposium. But one of the problem that I have noticed is that we, uh, a lot of people would like to do research, but we have problems on the connectivity uh, between the boundaries. That is that we have to uh, try to set up some meeting with CITES and try to make sure that, you know, to send samples across the countries uh, for research should have some kind of special um, exception because this has been really, really difficult. And the country like Thailand, we have um, a lot of equipment, but we probably will need um, more help from uh, other countries. And also countries that just began this stranding network like Vietnam or Cambodia or Myanmar, they can also benefit from this because they can send samples to us and we all can do this research together. And I think, um, for, for the topic of research, I'm sure certain countries have um, some pro uh, the definite problems that, that they are interested. And so uh, what Dr. Konkiet has mentioned, the database uh, is very, very important. Right now, um, we have uh, good connections. We are all friends and we have this WhatsApp or you know, all these um, discussion groups going on, but it is not tangible. So um, I would like to suggest that if you can have some kind of center, which is like a IT center, where everyone can put in the data uh, from their countries or their problems that they would like to be solved by uh, the neighboring country, something like this, you know, and this would be a, a real strong network. Um, one of the things that I have noticed is that a lot of times when stranding happens, um, there's not enough people in that countries or enough experts. Uh, we need the central funding to try to send people across, you know, just because we all don't work for money anyway, we, we, we have passion. So what would be nice is if you can get like private sectors or, or some kind of organization to fund for the traveling and food, that, that's it, that's all we need. And um, you know our team or your team can come and help us, and we can go and help you, you know, as as soon as possible. Because all this time that we discussed over the social network, mostly the carcass has been decomposed, and we get nothing. So time is very important. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nantarika. So I pass to Dr. Pacharapon. Do you have any recommend? Or, or maybe if if not, uh Dr. Ellen, please. Are you still here with us? 
Thank you. Hi, everybody. I, I totally agree with what's been said before. I think, I think the CMAM is, is important and is a lot more a lot more action than, than just the WhatsApp. Um, I, I think we should keep training each other. I, I'd like to see um, if, if you're going out on a survey, invite people from different countries. Uh, I'd like to see maybe other people. I mean, Dipani is doing such amazing stuff on a shoestring and really working hard to create a, a new cadre of Indian researchers. I'd, I'd like to see those researchers invited to other countries or maybe Dupani's group inviting someone from Thailand or Malaysia or Vietnam or Cambodia. I think we need to really share our knowledge in very direct ways out in the field. And, and Dr. Conkhead is totally right that database sharing is, is, I believe, critical because, you know, yes. especially looking at the oceanography in this area, um, these are not the animal's borders. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Alan. So, uh, Dipani, please give us the recommendation. Uh, you you do, unmute your microphone first. Yeah, um, I don't know. Uh, I, I I started off uh, after my first ma after I finished my masters on dolphins. I met Brian and Ellen and all of them, and I knew there was a whole world out there of researchers. So one of my beginnings of uh, all kinds of field research happened in Thailand at the Phuket Marine Biological uh, Science Institute, but. Um, I find it very difficult to actually recommend actually recommend uh, something for another region. Uh, but I do agree about uh, building capacity. And when I mean building capacity, I don't mean that I go to Thailand and uh, do something and uh, then the people there are only writing up and they're not really doing the research or not doing the analysis, you know. Uh, when we say build capacity, we say build the capacity of that person so that they can carry on this work themselves. So uh, that is the way I see capacity. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, having the next CFAM conference, sharing data or at least sharing results so that you can publish together because data sharing is easy to say, but not easy to do. Not just because of personal or professional reasons, but also because of uh, national regulations, right? Uh, so we should at least be able to use similar methods so that our results are comparable and useful for conservation. Uh, but, but yes, build your capacity so that, you know, in the long term, you don't have to use fossil fuels for somebody else to come do the work. That's my fossil fuel is a big thing. So yeah, that's, that would be my thing. Yes. Next one, please, uh, Dr. Thierry. Are you still with us? Um, yes, yes I, I'm still Thank here. You. And yeah, I, I would just, I would say, I would endorse what everybody else has recommended. Uh, I do agree that foreigners coming to other countries and doing a little bit of work is not as productive, I think, as getting people in those countries up and running with these techniques. Uh, I'm happy to say that we have a student from Thailand who's working with us and doing a PhD. So we are very pleased with that opportunity and we hope that once she finishes, she will come back to Thailand and do great things for wildlife health and sea turtles and coral reefs. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I have a question for the veterinary. As the veterinarian, so I think the regional disease rank in this region is quite not it's not enough. Do you have uh, some recommend for for this issue? For for uh, wildlife health. Is, uh, for the disease sovereign in the sea turtles or in the marine mammals, uh, in the well, I, in I, this. I can, I can say that I can. I can say that the disease 
The wildlife health investigation capacity has been very useful in Hawaii and the Pacific for recovering endangered species. We're very good as biologists in monitoring things, but we're not very good at, at getting answers and intervening to recover populations. And I, I, I think that that's where wildlife health could really play a very important role. And there's some very good examples for birds, coral reefs in Hawaii and the Pacific where wildlife health investigations have led to significant management, positive management interventions. So I would encourage everybody to think about more broadly than just sea turtles and marine mammals. It's, it's applicable to both terrestrial and marine ecosystems. Thank you so much. Yes, the, the, last, the last speaker, please, uh, Professor Sule. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, ah. you can hear. Yes, thank you. Uh, I would like uh, to suggest that uh, um, me that nowadays we need to get a lot of data through many ways to uh, come up with method or measures. So I would like to the reason we we propose the smart protection of the ecosystem is to uh, free people, free us from the labor and time intensive data collection into the Mind uh, come up uh, that we can uh, spend more time and effort to come up with ideas and to conduct efforts to uh, solve the problem uh, rather than just rely on the uh, rely on the the, the uh, in labor intensive uh, and time consuming uh, efforts to wait uh, for the uh, uh, stranding response and. Uh, I would like to suggest uh, we not only uh, I mean uh, rely on the once there is a report, then we, we do some uh, we we we, we uh, conduct some response. We can through the smart possession of the ecosystem, we can predict when, where, and what we should prepare to uh, to make uh, uh, measures or productions. Uh, rather than to we, we get alarm, then we go out, we get another alarm, then we go out again. So we, we keep using, uh, I mean, uh, getting uh, off fires and uh, the effect, um, or while the effect is not uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, um, I mean, yeah, um, ideal to us. Uh, the other thing is that I would like to. Uh, to suggest that we uh, need to pay more attention to transfer our knowledge and results to the public to let them know and accept the value and importance of these animals and ecosystem, and also to draw their support to our measures and to draw their uh, active uh, involvement in the conservation of the biodiversity and the ecosystem. So that's my uh, suggestion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Sule. So we have time limit and this time is the, the, final, uh, the last chance for us to summarize. So if uh, the audience have a Q&A, you can leave your Q&A in the chat box and we will reply your uh, question uh, via email. So for after finish the, the meeting, we will summarize our discussion and recommendation and send you all of you via emails. So I believe that uh, uh, this event is of a great uh, importance to all stakeholders involved in marine mammal and sea turtle conservation initiate a network for marine mammal and sea turtle population assessment toward the, level, uh, toward the development of UN decade action for the conservation. Before we close the conference on behalf of Department of Marine and Coastal Resources, we would like to take this opportunity to sincere thank you 
uh, sincerely thank all of speakers, audience, and our sponsor, IUN's Westpac, and Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment, Thailand, for make uh, uh, for make us together. So I think uh, we can close the conference like uh, uh, just says thank you. And uh, I would like to take a photo, a cap for all of your speaker and audience. So please turn on your, your camera and just take a, take a minute. Take a second. Yeah. Just, okay. Okay, we have right now 88 uh, audience. So we will take a photo for the first for the first page. We have four page, four pages. So for the first one, okay. One, two, three, smile. Okay, next one is the page number two. So let next. Okay, the page number two. Okay, one, two, three. Oh, I, I, I'm waiting for the number, number, number two page. Okay, one more time. One, two, three. Thank you. Uh, next one is number three. Okay. No one open. Okay. No, no one will turn the camera on. So that's that's the cap your name. Okay, that's fine. Okay, the last the last page. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, thank you so much for joining us. Goodbye. Have a nice day. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for opening ceremony. Happy birthday. 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 Oh, I, I'm oh, so excited that the first time for me. So the first time for me and Dr. Wachara to to conduct the, the convener. I, I, I would like to apologize for accident or something mistake. Yeah. Um, congratulations. It's been Thank very you. Bye. Bye. You did oh, a wonderful job. Yeah. Uh, uh, our team, DMCR, uh, Misu team, don't forget to report your uh, don't forget to <laughs> hear me the like uh how to your your record thank you so much goodbye bye <laughs>